Friends, the Lord be with you. Hello, my name is Joshua Holland Dolan, and I'm the youth director here at City Church San Francisco. Welcome to our worship today. Very happy to report that I'm coming to you live from our regular worship location here at the Russian Center. And it's a true joy to be with you this morning. Today and next week, we're going to be live streaming here as we prepare to welcome you back to this space over the next summer months. And hopefully we anticipate a full relaunch back this September. But today it's just myself and a few of the staff here. Um, so rest assured you didn't miss out on an invitation to gather and worship in person. As our city reopens this week, please stay tuned for more info when, on when you might be able to gather here again with us. So join me now in our call to worship from Psalm 84. Please stand if you are able. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. Happy are those who live in the house of the Lord, ever singing your praise, O God. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the pathways to your dwelling place. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the palace of the wicked. For the Lord is a strength, a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does God withhold. O Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Let us pray. God of peace, in our weariness and our longing, we cry out to you. We affirm with the psalmist that your presence brings us life. So in this moment, allow us to bring the fears and conflicts that we carry into the light of your presence. Help us find our way to you so that we can find rest, hope, and joy that many of us need today. We ask this in the name of Christ, our brother. Amen. Please join us now as we sing. God of mercy, full of grace, you are forever, always forever, slow to anger, rich in love, you are forever, always forever, we hear you. So let the heavens roll, echo across the ground, and as your people sing of your majesty, Lord, hear the sound, Lord, hear the sound.
call to confession is from 1 John 3, 18. Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. While our highest calling as Christians is to love God and neighbor, the scripture here is cognizant of the reality that many times in our lives, our love fails to translate into action. But where we fail, God is faithful. And we see this most clearly in Jesus, who by becoming one of us shows us the depths to which God will love us. In his life, we see a God who does not stand at a distance, but touches lepers, sheds tears, feels heartache, eats with sinners, failures, and outcasts, and calls them to be his disciples. And this is the same Christ who's ready to offer us grace right now in this moment. So let's remember Christ as we say the prayer of confession together. Holy and compassionate God, you have loved us with unfailing, self-giving mercy. But we have not loved as you love. You constantly call us, but we do not listen. You ask us to love, but we walk away from our neighbors in need, wrapped in our own concerns. We condone evil, prejudice, warfare, and greed. God of grace, as you come to us in mercy, we repent in spirit and in truth, admit our sin, and gratefully receive your forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Take a moment now for silent confession. Now hear these words of encouragement from Isaiah. God says, remember these things, my people. I formed you. You are my servant. You will not be forgotten by me. I have swept away your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. This is the good news. Thanks be to God. And now that we receive God's peace, let's extend that peace to each other. You can do that to those around you in the same room as you on our live chat or through text. But first from me to you, the peace of Christ be with you all. God and Jesus fully know, Creator, Word, and Spirit one. Hallelujah, 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 Friends, this is the time in our service where we bless our children and youth. And before we give, before I give our blessing our day, I wanted to just extend a special shout out to our family ministries team 
for an amazing week at City Camp. I want to shout out to Barbara and Wendy and our Calvary staff for the hours of creativity and planning that they did to make this week an unforgettable week with several campers telling me that this is the best city camp we have ever done. And I also want to give a special shout out to our very own adult and youth volunteers who showed up every day and never once complained and generously gave their time and their energy to make all this possible. Thank you so much. To our kids, I had such a blast hanging out with all of you and learning about God and God's worlds, seeing all the really cool insects and animals with our presentations, and of course, playing dodgeball and capture the flag with all of you. And I hope to see you again soon. Hopefully, we'll be able to see each other sooner rather than later. And I want to tell you that our greatest prayer for you here at City Church is that you would truly know how much you are loved in God. So now, people of God, what is our prayer for these children and youth? May the Lord be with you. And the children and youth say, and also with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord grow you strong in divine grace. And may the Lord fill you with the love of Christ. And we all say, thanks be to God. rest in God alone. My salvation comes from Him. My soul finds rest. God is my hope. I will not be shaken. I will not Joy or pain, I sing praise to you. Night or day, I sing praise to you. My soul finds rest.
Let us pray. Gracious God, help us today that we might find rest for our soul in you. That behind all of our frantic striving, behind the exhaustion that we feel right now is trying to find rest in all sorts of ways that are just not enough. Help us to believe that you are enough. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, here we are, live streaming again from the Russian Center, figuring out all the technology, uh, making adjustments. Really glad we've got these few weeks to run up. Our hope and our goal, as Josh mentioned earlier in the service, is that we might have as many are as are allowed uh, to be in this space with us on June the 27th. So, you know, do what's best for you, what's most comfortable for you as you try to figure it out. There's no manual on how we get through this transition together, but we'll figure it out. And so we hope you can join us on the 27th uh, to whatever degree we're allowed to get together. And uh, I'm very optimistic about that. So anyway, greetings. My name is Fred Harrell. I'm the senior pastor here, and I'm really glad you're here with us today. City Church aspires to be an inclusive community of Jesus followers. Um, we are rooted in Christian faith. Um, we are curious always about the ongoing guidance of the Holy Spirit as we make room for everyone in our community to belong. So to that end, we welcome all persons uh, into our faith community, regardless of gender, race, age, physical or mental capacity, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, or socioeconomic or marital status. A couple of announcements I have for you today that I want to highlight to make sure you're aware of, ways that you can get involved in the life of our church in the, in the next few weeks. The first is, is our next community gathering will be at Park Lab Gardens in Mission Bay this Thursday, June 17th from 6 to 8 p.m. This is a fantastic way to get to know new people. Uh, maybe the only way you know anybody at City Church right now is through a screen because you've joined us in the last year. Fantastic opportunity to, uh, to put a, a, an actual flesh-to-flesh uh, -flesh face on a screen face. Uh, by joining us on Thursday. So I'll be there. Some others will be there 6 to 8 p.m. this Thursday. Um, a quick reminder that if you would like to receive the $100 discount for the 2021-2022 Faith and Justice Fellowship, that would be what we used to call the Newbigin Fellows Program, uh, you need to apply before June 15th. That would be Tuesday. And we know you all want to apply for this nine-month transformational journey. Fantastic. Just had their big info session this past week. I think 50 or 60 folks uh, were involved in the info session from all over the country and even outside of our country. So we're really excited about the possibilities this year. If you'd like to join up for that, get that discount, apply before June 15. The youth today will meet uh, on Zoom. Middle school meets from 5 to 6 p.m. High school meets from 6 to 7 p.m. Also, we've been telling you about the upcoming youth back to school retreat. Um, at Zephyr Point on Lake Tahoe. And today we have a special invitation from Joshua and our guest speaker at the Youth Back to School Retreat, Reverend Isaiah Young. So let's take a look at that now. Hey, City Church Youth, Joshua here, hanging with the Reverend Isaiah Young. As you know, Isaiah is scheduled to be our guest speaker for our upcoming youth retreat in August, which I'm super pumped about. And uh, we are here hanging out with Isaiah today, um, and we're just going to get to know him a little bit. Isaiah, thank you for being here. It's so good to be with you, Joshua. Thank you so much. I'm so excited for this retreat. We are too. Uh, can you tell us one interesting fact that we need to know about you before coming on this retreat? Well, one of the facts I think is important to know about me is that I am multiracial. My father was born and is from Malaysia, and he's Chinese, and my mom is Mexican-American, and so I am a Chexican. I am both Chinese and Mexican, and I love uh, seeing Chexican. and learning about like culture that. and difference, and I can't wait to meet all of you and hear your stories. Love it. Really excited. This is a good segue into our theme um, for this year, um, for our summer retreat, which is seeing in color. And this theme in a nutshell is saying that when we encounter God in a real way, 
all of a sudden our vision of the world begins to shift. And specifically what begins to happen is that we begin to see people differently, um, especially people on the margins of society, because we begin to experience Jesus's heart towards them. And Isaiah, I wanted to put it to you and ask you, when you think about new eyes or new vision that God's spirit wants to give us, um, what kind of new vision do you think God's spirit is calling to give to our young people today? Well, I really truly believe that our young people have such um, insight and passion to offer our time. We know we're going through collective crises on multiple levels. And I believe that deep within all of our young people lie creativity, lies courage, lies resilience and possibility. And I can't wait to learn from the young people on this retreat and learn with the young people on this retreat about how we can imagine a different world, a different society where all of us can be included, where all of us can thrive, where all of us can bring our unique perspectives and experiences to the table to make a richer community. Man. Okay, if you are a student in grades six through 12th, um, and this includes all of our newly graduated sixth graders, you are invited to our back to school retreat happening August 6th through the 8th at the beautiful Zephyr Point Conference Center in Lake Tahoe. There will be a link for registration in our chat. And students, you really wanna make this a priority. Our retreats, as you know, are where new memories and new friendships are formed. You don't wanna miss out on any of the fun activities that we have planned along with learning more from Isaiah and hanging out with him in our sessions. So we will see you there. Do not miss out. Hey city. Okay, so here are the details. August 6 to 8, total cost $125. Financial assistance is available. Registration closes July 23. Sign up at the link in the chat. Fantastic opportunity to learn from this amazing person, Isaiah Young, who we have benefited from hearing from before. And then finally, a couple of classes that we're going to be offering in our three friendships curriculum that um, are addressing some really important contemporary issues of our day through a Christian lens. Uh, first, a class titled Adopting a Foreigner Status, a Christian Response to Anti-Asian Racism um, with Dr. Russell Jiong will happen on Thursday, June 24th. 7 p.m. should be a link popping up there for that as well. We've heard from Dr. Jiang before. He is really a leader in this country um, on this issue, has been from the very beginning, um, has been documenting instances of AAPI hate crimes, and just has so much to teach us as we try to figure out how we best respond with love and justice. And so that'll be on June 24th at 7 p.m. Don't want to miss that. And then secondly, a 10-week study group called Exploring Abolition a Christian response to police brutality. This is going to be led by Amanda Samuel. You may not have met Amanda yet. She's a part of our congregation. Uh, Amanda moved here, I think, right at the beginning of COVID, lives in the inner sunset. She's a Midwest transplant, University of Wisconsin grad, uh, got her certificate of public theology from Newbigin House of Studies, uh, works in tech here. She's really a great teacher, a great guide to help us on this 10-week study going to be using some material from the Mennonite church that I think is going to be really fascinating and give us a way to, uh, to really explore um, how we might respond as well, again, with love and justice and be well informed. So that's going to be happening. You can sign up for both of these three friendship courses at the link in your chat. You'll see that there. So those are all of my announcements for today. Uh, please now listen to the scripture reading. The scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, Seventy times, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, 
His Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. And when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. They went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to you, to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The word of the Lord. Take a moment now for silent reflection. Let us pray. Gracious God, help us to believe that we are tuned into this right now, gathered in this room, a few of us, because you have seen to it. You have something you want us to hear, something you want us to be challenged by, perhaps, something that you want us to trust. I pray today, Lord, that as we look at this topic that is so difficult, forgiveness, that we would do so in light of believing that we have been utterly and completely forgiven by you and that we are your beloved children. Help us to remember that as we listen to this sermon today. Give us grace to respond in ways you ask us to respond, even when we're not sure how we can do it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the email showed up in my inbox about a month or so ago, seemingly out of the blue. Someone who has hurt me deeply. Someone who I had invested more than a decade of my life and then just ghosted me without an explanation. And now they want to meet. We're going to do this tomorrow. The email isn't exactly great. It said, if, if I did anything to offend or upset you, please forgive me. And it's an expression that I've heard many times, not just towards me, but towards others as well, which often means I don't want to talk about anything I've done wrong. I just want you to forgive me so we can move on. But for what? What am I supposed to forgive this person of? Specificity is necessary because forgiveness is always messy business. It's not our mother tongue, so we don't know how to talk about it. I let this sit in my inbox for about a month before responding with a simple, would you like to get coffee? That appointment happens tomorrow, so say a prayer. I may begin with saying, you will have my forgiveness, but what would you tell me what I need to forgive you for? And while the request in this email for forgiveness is timid and perhaps incomplete and maybe avoiding responsibilities, the person will have my forgiveness. Not because I want to grant it, I'll be honest. Not because I'm perfectly over it. 
Not because I'm going to retrust this person in any way at all, maybe for the rest of my life. Because trust is earned. It's not a gift. And anyone who treats a relationship that cavalierly will need to earn back trust over time. And that's their decision, really, not mine. So why am I doing it? Why am I having this meeting? Why not just let the email just sit there and go away? I mean, after all, the email actually said, no need to respond if you don't want to. Why am I doing it? Well, because of texts like you just heard Joshua read. And the Beatitudes, be merciful, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. And the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins. This is the part we forget about that, I think. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others who sin against us. And because Jesus said, Father, forgive them on the cross. And because I recite the Apostles' Creed regularly, that I believe in the forgiveness of sins, and I can just keep on going with reason after reason. But I don't want to forgive, honestly. I do it as an act of the will, an act of obedience, and pray that at some point the feelings will follow. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, and sometimes it's a mix. I'll do this because forgiveness both receiving and granting it is at the heart of Christianity. And I am trying to be a Christ follower. So I don't think I have a choice, really. But it will be hard. Forgiveness may be the hardest thing Jesus asks us to do. And here it comes along Peter. They've had that conversation about conflicts in the church and Sins being committed against one another. And, and so Peter's concerned about this. So he asks this question, you know, to what extent are we expected to forgive? And that's really what he's asking. To what extent? How much do we have to do this? I mean, at what point do we cross the line and not have to do this any longer? What are the possibilities? And I have little doubt that Peter was feeling really good about his offer of seven times. Pretty great. Right, Jesus? And if you read any things about Jesus in the Gospels, you'll know that a lot of times our, our grand ideas are not exactly appreciated. <laughs> so Jesus responds famously, um, to the complete shock of Peter, a number. We're, it's ambiguous in the Greek. Is it 77 or 70 times 7? The NRSV puts it 77. I think it's 70 times 7. I think that's the best choice of those two it, it, it's, it doesn't matter They're, it's outlandish and it represents infinity but i think it's important because there's another place where in the bible where we have this 70 times 7 situation happening it's because jesus is recalling i think what we might say is a a bloody limerick from the book of genesis when a man named lamech boasts I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's vengeance is sevenfold, then my vengeance is 70 times sevenfold. I think Jesus is recalling that because Jesus is always flipping things on their head. For Lamech, the big thing was exponential revenge. And Jesus turns that over and says, no, exponential revenge forgiveness exponential forgiveness here's why the christ-like love that absorbs the blow and responds with forgiveness is the only real hope we have in this world for real change i think this is why jesus renounces revenge to respond to hate with hate you know what it does it just enshrines the status quo and only guarantees that hate will win. And that's what keeps the world as it is. Hatred, no matter how justifiable, simply fuels the endless cycle of revenge. And Christianity has more to offer this world than recycled revenge. 
There's a book by Solomon Schimmel called Wounds Not Healed by Time. And he tells this story. During the Armenian genocide of 1950 to 1915 to 1917, one and a half million Armenians were murdered by Ottoman Turks, and millions more were assaulted and forcibly departed, deported. From the Armenian genocide comes a famous story of a Turkish army officer who had led a raid upon the home of an Armenian family. The parents were killed, the daughters were assaulted, the girls were given to the soldiers. One officer kept the oldest daughter for himself. And eventually that oldest daughter was able to escape and later trained to become a nurse. And in an ironic twist of fate, she found herself working on a ward for wounded Turkish army officers. And one night, by the dim glow of a lantern, she saw among her patients the face of the man who had murdered her parents and so horribly abused her sisters and herself. Without exceptional nursing, he would die. And that is what the Armenian nurse gave, exceptional care. As the officer began to recover, a doctor pointed to the nurse and told the officer, if it weren't for this woman, you would be dead. The officer looked at the nurse and asked, Have we met? Yes, she replied. And after a long silence, the Turkish army officer asked, Why didn't you kill me? The Armenian Christian replied, I'm a follower of him who said, Love your enemies. For that Christian, no further explanation was necessary. For her, forgiveness was not an option. It was a requirement. It was the practice of forgiveness in her mind, and I believe it needs to be in ours, is synonymous, actually, with being a Christian. And so Jesus makes it pretty clear to Peter that this forgiveness is not an option. It's a necessity. And then Jesus tells a slightly helpful parable? <laughs> I mean, that's what you're going to find in this sermon series, Tell It Slant, that these parables are kind of helpful sometimes. And this one is. But just a reminder about parables. We must be careful to distinguish between parable and allegory. As in many rabbinic parables, the figure of the king can serve allegorically as a reference to God but this does not mean that all of the details of the king's behavior and character are a one-to-one -one correlation to the character of God. So just as we do not regard God as a despot who would sell women into sexual slavery as punishment for their husband's sin, so we need not take the concluding detail of this parable about unending physical torture as a definitive theology of God's nature. Don't let that pretty typical, honestly, of first century parables. Don't let the typical hyperbolic, um, extreme, apocalyptic language, don't let it have you missing the point. But don't let yourself fully off the hook either. And I think that's part of the, what's going on here. I mean, honestly, some of the most conditional sounding things ever said in the New Testament is around this idea of forgiveness. Want to be forgiven? You have to forgive. But let's make it clear. God is not in the business of forgiving those with a perfect record of forgiving from the heart. God is not forgiving me or you based on our performance of forgiveness. God doesn't torture people until they do forgive either. But in God's wisdom, we have Jesus stories and Jesus statements that underscore the absolute crucial nature of forgiveness in God's economy. It's as if God is saying, you know, those statements, they're not maybe accurately describing me, but you know what? We're going to let them stand because forgiveness is urgent 
business. Now, also in this parable, the word slaves, it's a really, I think, an unfortunate translation. Because the most likely setting for this parable, what Jesus is maybe having in mind and what his audience would be actually thinking is more along the lines of a Gentile court system of the day. The man, this man was more likely one of this king's tax collectors or tax farmers. The king of a region would have all sorts of clients working beneath him. And some were a higher status than others. And it was a great place to be because you were in much better shape as a person if you were part of the, the royal uh, system than 80% of the population, which wasn't, which was mostly peasants and artisans. And so people jockeyed to have position as one of the king's clients. And this particular one owes a lot of money. He collected on behalf of the king, and the collection is woefully inadequate. And Jesus, as he often does in parables, takes this kind of to the theater of the absurd. A talent was a monetary unit worth about 20 years of wages for a laborer, one talent. So 10,000 talents would be equivalent to 2 million years of wages. I mean, tens of billions of dollars. The point is it's not actually repayable. He's not able to repay it. But as the king... The king forgives. Now, Jesus is drawing, I think, from real life here as well. Because what the commentators will tell you is they, they speculate that rulers would sometimes make grand gestures of debt forgiveness to make themselves look like some type of a Messiah figure. So there may be going, maybe more going on than this mere pity with this king's debt forgiveness. And like the first century Gentile economic system, there was a hierarchy. If you're part of it, you, know, you were much better off. You had lesser clients. And so this client of the king demands payment from a lesser client. He asks for debt forgiveness. This man, having just been forgiven, says, no, pay up or I'll have you thrown in jail. And that scandal is observed by the minions jockeying for higher position in the royal court. And so reports are made. And the king responds with punishment in scene. Okay, so what are the takeaways? Two big ones. Two big ones. And the first is obvious, and that is that forgiveness is essential. It's essential for the good of your soul. You may be familiar with the Anne Lamott quote where she says that not forgiving is like eating rat poison and expecting the rat to die. But here's the thing. How do we actually go about it? Forgiveness, that is. One of my favorite ways of thinking about this comes from Carolyn Miss and her beautiful book, Enter the Castle, An Inner Path to God and Your Soul. It's a guide to the life and times of St. Teresa of Avila, the extraordinary 16th century saint and contemplative master. And she talks about those we have not forgiven as prisoners that we lock up in cells in a dungeon. That the people that we won't forget are prisoners in cells in our dungeon. Who are your prisoners? We all have them. The parents you can't forgive are in a cell. The business partner who cheated you and whom you still resent is in a cell. The ex-spouse is in a cell. The co-worker who undermines you is in a cell. The friend who ghosted you is in a cell. The church or organization that traumatized you or perhaps kicked you out because you were gay or because you are asking too many questions, or because you're questioning authority, any number of reasons are in a cell. And she goes on to talk about how these people that we're holding in these cells are likely holding you prisoner as well. And we keep them in there because we don't think they've paid for their wrongdoing. She says that your soul, of course, is not by nature a warden. She talks about our souls are not by nature a warden. We're not, 
it, she, she actually treats the soul as saying something to us. Don't imprison trauma and rage inside me. Don't lock up images of vengeance within me and believe you're being righteous. Don't try to justify yourself with self-pity and present protestations of your innocence. Events happen as they do for reasons greater than your reason can comprehend. And she says your challenge is to develop the strength to accept things as they happen, learn from them, and move on. You're not the great executioner, she says. And then she says this. She then asks us to dialogue with each of those prisoners, whatever they may be, one at a time. She says, as you look at the prisoner, review what's coming up in you. Review the energy, the emotions, and thoughts that have become prominent in your mind as a result of you holding this person in your dungeon. Journaling that out would be a really good idea as well. And then I'm going to plot this up for you, this quote. She says, There comes a point at which you have to let go and forgive. You can start your prayer with, Help me to forgive because I don't want to forgive. I feel entitled to be angry even though the anger is killing me, not them. And no one really cares that I'm angry. It's destroying my life, not theirs. I want to punish someone, so I punish my kids, or I punish other innocent people who have never harmed me because it is my way of punishing them. So I really don't want to forgive, because then I think all my hurt will be forgotten, and that feels so unfair. But what is fair? No one's hurt is fair. I just think that justice should revolve around me. So help me to forgive. One person at a time, beginning with fill in the blank. That's your beginning. You take it from there until you've emptied your dungeon. Whenever you add new prisoners, you'll have to revisit your dungeon. You know, that part, if you remember, notice this in that quote, that part about punishing others, when you haven't forgiven the persons who have actually wronged you, you know, there's a very good chance that anyone who is really, seems like almost ridiculously angry and resentful towards you and they just can't let it go, are really angry and resentful toward their parents or some other authority figure in their life. And they are displacing that anger onto you, especially if you are their boss or any kind of authority figure in their life, this is how humans operate. And Jesus is calling us out of that cycle. So when you empty the dungeons, it doesn't mean everything will be fine. Forgiveness is not synonymous with healing or reconciliation. Healing has its own timetable. Reconciliation isn't possible sometimes. Sometimes our lives depend on us severing ties with our offenders, even after we've forgiven them. In this sense, forgiveness is not an end. It's just the beginning of a journey. This is why Debbie Thomas says, for this reason, I worry that romanticizing forgiveness obscures its communal, multi-layered power. This is always true, but it's especially true when we're talking about marginalized communities. In white Christian America, it's too easy to think of forgiveness as a culminating act, as a redemptive happily ever after ending to the story of race-based violence, for instance. But when, for example, victims of racial hatred forgive their racist oppressors, they're not ending anything. They're preparing their hearts to begin, to resist, to approach the battlefield one more wearisome time, Forgiveness enables the oppressed not only to survive, but to lay down the cumbersome weight of hatred and bitterness and gear up for the fight. Forgiveness is the beginning of the hard work of building God's kingdom, not the end. And then the last and second big takeaway here is that forgiveness needs fuel. When you say, I can't do this, you're right, you can't, and nor can I. We need fuel. We need something extra. 
The commands to forgive others in Scripture usually are immediately connected to do so as we have been forgiven ourselves. In other words, Jesus and the apostles seem to believe that being a recipient of the infinite love of God should create a wellspring of an infinite capacity to forgive. In other words, we forgive out of our experience of being forgiven. We love infinitely out of the reality of being infinitely loved. We love with the love of God and forgive with the forgiveness we have received. That's the idea. Jesus only calls us to give what we have received, unbounded forgiveness. That's the fuel. It's why Richard Rohr, when he was preaching on the Sermon on the Mount and blessed are the merciful, for they will become merciful, they will extend mercy. A lifetime of received forgiveness, he says, allows you to become mercy. You become forgiveness because that's the only thing that makes sense to you. The only thing that's alive within you. Mercy becomes your energy, your meaning. This is why, friends, the most unforgiving and judgmental people are to be pitied. Because if they are this hard on others, they are almost assuredly even more ruthless with themselves. Understanding yourself to be, get, to be the forgiven, beloved child of God is the gateway and the fuel to the radical forgiveness that God calls us to embody in this life. And so what do you think that God thinks about you? As you stand in the presence of God, what do you imagine God is thinking about you? When I think of what it would be like to be fully in the presence of God, I believe I would see myself as fully and candidly and as compassionately as God sees me. Rowan Williams actually said that, and I agree. Have you traced your struggle to forgive others to how you may not actually have forgiven yourself? Or believed that God actually forgives you. That might be the place to start. Somebody says, this is it practical. The Sermon on the Mount and all of these things that Jesus said, they're always, they're always not practical. The problem is, he not only said it, he lived it out. When Jesus prayed for his enemies to be forgiven as they drove nails into his hands, he was living his own sermon, and he was validating his right to preach it. And after that, no one would dare claim that Jesus' teaching was not practical. Jesus had lived it, died for it, and been vindicated by God in resurrection. That's why we forgive. So friends, what about you? How is this landing for you right now? I tried to give you a warning that this is going to be difficult. <laughs> but let me be clear. Forgiveness is not retrusting someone who has hurt you. Forgiveness is not denial. Forgiveness is not pretending that an offense doesn't matter or that a wound doesn't hurt. Forgiveness is not a detour or a shortcut. The same Bible that talks about forgiveness and calls us to forgive also calls us, calls us to mourn and to lament, to speak truth to power, to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Forgiveness is not quick or easy. But what would it look like for you to start to unlock those cells and clear your dungeon of the prisoners? You know, we are a congregation on a mission, a mission of justice, a mission of transformation that is trying to take the words of Jesus seriously, not just to worship Jesus, 
but to listen to Jesus' ideas and try to embody them as a community and individually so that everyone can flourish, so that everyone can have enough, so that everyone can thrive. We can't be that community. We cannot be that community if we are individually and collectively nursing, even cherishing our resentments. We cannot be what God is calling us to be when we stay in that cycle. And so, friends, let us take up the work of forgiveness for the sake of a broken and desperate world to end the cycles of vengeance, to point to a more transformative way of being in the world, to be liberated from our resentments that make us so small. Forgiveness is liberation. Let us pray. This is a hard word for us. Very complex and nuanced. Give us grace, Lord, to follow you in this perhaps hardest command. Help us to begin to take steps in whatever ways we need today to unlock cells, to liberate prisoners as we are being liberated ourselves through the power of forgiveness. And help us to know that in the work and in the person of your son Jesus, you call us to recognize and to know your love and your forgiveness in a profound and transformative way. Bring that to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. My friends, as many of you probably have noted or seen on social media or the news or elsewhere, um, the tragedy at the Pulse nightclub five years ago yesterday is a reminder that every day we must fight together to protect LGBTQ people and other marginalized communities against hate and violence. But today we're going to pause to remember and pray this litany that's going to come up on your screen in just a moment from the Pulse Memorial Service hosted by Metropolitan Community Churches in Orlando back on the first anniversary of the massacre. Your refrain will come up on the screen for you. Let us pray. God of life and justice, we thank you for your creation, for bodies that sweat that move to the beat of music, that embrace one another with passion and desire. We thank you for the ministry of the dance floor that connects us to one another across generations, languages, skin tones, and economic status. We remember the lives of 49 people who were murdered in the Pulse nightclub shooting. God who remembers, hear our prayer. We place in your tender hands families that were torn apart, Lovers who lost their love, parents who lost their children, friends who lost their friends. God of reconciliation, hear our prayer. We remember the 53 people who were wounded and the countless others who were wounded spiritually, psychologically, and physically in other ways. God of healing, hear our prayer. Grant us the strength to seek forgiveness for the shooter. God who forgives, hear our prayer. Bind us together in our compulsion to continue our unfinished calling and prophetic destiny to demand, proclaim, and do justice in the world. God of enduring love, hear our prayer. Allow us to be ever mindful of the important work to unite sexuality and spirituality, working to be united in body and spirit, Help us affirm our bodies, our genders, our sexualities, and the bodies, genders, and sexualities around us. God of glitter and grit, hear our prayer. Amen. You know, this is a reminder of the importance of the safe space that City Church provides for our LGBTQ siblings to nurture, to develop, and strengthen their faith. We know that creating this space saves lives 
which is why I think giving to City Church San Francisco is such a wise and strategic investment. Now, you know we're trying to catch up with our budget goals this summer, and we're making it easier than ever for you to give. You will see a giving link in the chat, as well as our text to give option. You can text CCSF to 77977, or just in case your carrier doesn't work for that code, you can text to 833-245-8442. I would ask you to consider a special one-time gift and consider also signing up to be a recurring giver. That helps us tremendously to plan, and we have so many great plans for the future. We've added on more recurring givers so far this summer, so that's a really great start. Some of you have made a special one-time gift. Thank you so much for that generous support. Together, we can meet this shortfall. And so join me now in the offering prayer, together praying. With these gifts, O oh God, we remember with thanksgiving the life that we have because of you. Make us grateful every day and help us to love as you love by offering ourselves and our resources for the well-being of all your world. Amen. of the Lord is the kindness of the Lord with every breath we take the gift of life and grace the power of the Lord is the meekness of the Lord who bore humanity with brave humility let your mercy flow through us your mercy, your mercy, let your mercy flow through us. Your mercy, your mercy, the beauty of the Lord is the suffering of the Lord, as Christ upon the tree. Stripped of dignity, the glory of the Lord is the mercy of the Lord, gives light for us to see a new humanity. Let your mercy flow through us, your mercy, your mercy. Let your mercy flow through us. Your mercy, your mercy. When they see us, may they see your mercy. Your mercy. When they know us, they know your, your mercy, your mercy, when they see us, may they see your mercy, your mercy, when they know us, may they know your mercy, your mercy. the hands and feet of those who serve in need of the broken and dust shame. Bless the weary soul, the Lord will make us whole. God speak peace to those afraid. May the words we speak Build a bridge for peace. Your love and kindness shows the way. Open up our doors, giving refuge for all the weary and afraid. 
Let your mercy flow through us. Your mercy, your mercy. Let your mercy flow through us. Your mercy, your mercy. As we come to this table this morning, this table of forgiveness, this reminder of the links to which Jesus went um, on behalf of us in this world, we remember that the table that Jesus sets is for everyone. All are welcome to this table without exception. In this table, we remember what Jesus has done. We encounter Jesus in the bread and the cup in ways that are very difficult to even articulate. And it previews another meal when God has promised to make all things right. And so Jesus invites you to come to be filled, to know you are the beloved child of God, and that God is already with you and invites you to awaken to this reality. If you can, where you are, please stand as we confess the faith of the church using the Apostles' Creed. Together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of, of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right to glorify you, gracious God, and to give you thanks. For you alone are God, living and true, dwelling in light and accessible from before time and forever. Countless throngs of angels stand before you to serve you night and day. And beholding the glory of your presence, they offer you unceasing praise. Joining with them and giving voice to every creature under heaven, we glorify your name and lift our voices in joyful praise, singing. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Those Merciful God, you loved the world so much that in the fullness of time you sent your only Son to be our Savior. He lived as one of us, yet was without sin. To the poor he proclaimed the good news of salvation, to prisoners freedom, to the sorrowful joy. To fulfill your purpose he gave himself up to death, and rising from the grave destroyed death and made the whole creation new. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Send your Holy Spirit that as she guides and nurtures us, this bread and cup may be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Gather your whole church, O Lord, into the glory of your kingdom. Through Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glories are yours now and forever. Amen. If you are standing, you may be seated. On the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, and after having given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, This is my body, which is given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup, 
And he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for the remission of your sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. The Apostle Paul tells us, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, that we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. So we'll be distributing the bread and the cup in your homes there, however you have set that apart. So we'll give you a moment to set everything together, and then we'll come back in just a moment, and we will partake of the gifts together. The gifts of God for the people of God, receive them with gladness. Behold what you are, become what you receive. body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Eat, remember, and believe. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Drink, remember, and believe. As we pray together now, the communion prayer together. God of our pilgrimage, you have led us to the bread of life. Refresh and sustain us as we go forward on our journey. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now the prayers of the people with Sarah Dahl. Let's pray together for the needs of our church and our world. When I say, Lord, in your mercy, Please respond. Hear our prayer. God of all creation, thank you for all of the hard work of scientists, doctors, and public health officials in our city. And thank you that we are at a place where we can begin to re-engage with our loved ones and our community safely. However we find ourselves as we prepare for our state's reopening on Tuesday, ecstatic, anxious, or just cautiously optimistic, we pray that we will step back into communal life with our eyes firmly fixed on your call to us to do justice, love mercy, and to continue to walk in humility with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, as we emerge back into some semblance of regular life, remind us that what we call normal is not always just or good. Teach us to see as you see, so that we can share in the tearing down of what you would see fall and put our hands to the loving care and restoration of all that is true and good and beautiful. Help us to step back into the world like gardeners, Lord, pruning and uprooting, yes, but also planting, tending, and delighting in all that glorifies you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus, we have not been able to gather in person around your table for over a year now. As we look forward to feasting together again and seeing the tangible reality of your body in our many colored and many shaped flesh gathered together, send your Holy Spirit among us anew. Help us, even as we delight in seeing one another again, to be mindful of who is missing. Gather us from our scattered places and help us to love and care for one another well. Remind us that we belong to one another because we all belong to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all peoples, we pray for the countries and regions still being ravaged by the coronavirus. Please guide those of us in rich countries to share our vaccines, our resources, and our prayers with our neighbors on this planet. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, in this summer season of ordinary time, teach us to walk daily with you. Tend our hearts as your garden. Help us seek your living water and the nourishment of your word so that we can grow more and more rooted in your saving love for us. Help us to bear fruit in season, to bless our world, and to bring glory and praise to your name. We ask all of this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The riches of this world will fade. The treasures of our God remain. Here I empty myself to know this world nothing and find everything in you. The riches of this world will fade. The treasures of our God remain. Here I empty myself. All right, friends, now receive and respond with enthusiasm to the benediction. As soon as I can get it called up here on my phone. Sorry about that little.
May God, our rock, be your sure foundation in every storm. May Christ, our Savior, be your victory over sin and death. May the Holy Spirit, our helper, be your guide in every time of need. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and be among you and remain with you always. And we all say together, Amen. A couple of announcements here. Uh, centering prayer this Thursday at 7 o'clock in the morning on Zoom. And just to let you know that uh, Jay Wilson is beginning a sabbatical here in a day or two. And so just wanted to let you all know that he's going to be on sabbatical through uh, middle of August or so. And uh, we're really grateful that Jay gets this break. Um, he is uh, such a critical part of our team and does such a great job. And so be praying for Jay and his family that they will be refreshed and rejuvenated. And then today's postlude is ESP by Wayne Shorter, performed by our own Sutter Street Quartet. Let us go forth to serve the world as those who love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Together, thanks be to God. Go in God's peace. <laughs>